Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. This is our weekly live stream. Glad you could join us. Hope everything is going well, wherever you are. Uh, this is the anniversary of September 11th. Kind of curious to know where you were, <clears throat> excuse me, where you were at that time and, and what you were doing, how you remember, how you remember that day. Uh, Niels, Han Dynasty, how you doing? Jeff Logue, how you doing? Jeff, first time I've seen you here, welcome aboard. Uh, if it is your first time here, go ahead and type in new and where you're from. We'll see if we can acknowledge you. Harold B, how are you doing, Harold? Uh, Seymour Rivers, yes, I'm looking forward to this episode with uh, Patrick and Gregor. Gregor Gregerson, the founder of Silver Bullion, uh, the safe house, and, and of course, you know, the reserve, which is the biggest silver ball in the world by capacity he is here so be sure to, to bring your questions for for gregor this is your chance to pretty much ask him almost anything uh you know with especially with precious metals i mean if you really want to know what's going on get a little bit of the the insiders info uh bring your questions and we can go ahead and, and ask them to to gregor uh again get some info about the reserve how things are going there with the um the uh, construction going there and um again just bring your questions for Gregor, you know, silver to gold ratio, premiums, whatever it may be, uh, how to vault, uh, what makes Singapore so special about the jurisdiction and, and why people do store here. Uh, go ahead and ask him all these things and um, we'll go ahead and get started in, in about 10 seconds or so. Again, thanks for being here. Uh, let's see, Paul, how are you doing? Derek Cho. Derek Cho, first time I've seen you here. Welcome aboard as well. Patrick Bateman, how are you doing? So we'll go ahead and get started. Here we go. So hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion. Glad that you could join us. And today we're going to be doing a live interview. We're going to have Gregor Gregerson with us, the founder and CEO of Silver Bullion over in Singapore. And as many of you know, SBTV is a part of Silver Bullion. And Gregor is also the founder of the Safe House of Precious Metals Vault in Singapore, one of the founders of Cash Gold, Gram Chain, and of course the Reserve, which is set to be the world's largest vault by capacity in Singapore. So Gregor Gregerson, welcome aboard. How are you doing? Uh, doing very well. Good to be here. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'll have to start off with uh, today being 9-11, the anniversary of what happened back back then. I just want to ask you, do you recall where you were and, and maybe what you were doing and, and what your thoughts were and, and maybe how it's led us to where we are today in some ways, how the world has changed? Uh, so 9-11, nine, nine I was actually in LAX. Um, I was sleeping. My my roommate, which was you know down in Oceanside, he called me up and said, hey, uh, turn on the TV. I just got woken up by somebody else. You need to see this. And that's how I wake up. And... I was actually working next, uh, literally from where I was working, I called CLIX. And I remember there was a line of about 100 police cars or so, which went over and shut down the airport. Um, so, yeah, so for some of the recollections of, of that day. Okay, yeah, that, that day, a lot of recollections also. Um, you know, I'd like to first start by asking you if you could give us an update on the reserve, the massive 15,000 ton vault in Singapore. Yes, the reserve is, is coming along. Um, we are having a bit of a delay. We're probably looking at uh, 20, 30 days or so in delay, which we're trying to catch up on now. Uh, but we are scheduled to be ready in April with the first part of it, which essentially is the main vaulting areas and the fourth and fifth floor, which are, say, uh, let's say, public areas. Uh, and then by, say, June, July, uh, we'll have the second and third floor ready, which is for additional uh, vaulting capacity. Um, and some of that is going to third party. So we're in talks with different uh, secure logistic providers right now uh, on on who's probably going to rent some of that area. Okay, got a question that uh, came in, Derek Cho, right off the bat. Let me let me bring this in here. Um, Derek Cho is saying uh, gold one hundred dollars over spot, silver ten dollars over spot. So he's he's wondering about those premiums. What can you tell us about these premiums? Um, on our side or, or in general in the US? I, I guess he's saying in general because I don't think ours are, are that far over spot. So 
what what I find is you know eagles and so on. So so every market is a little bit different. Um, in the U.S. right now, the premium for eagles and to some degree maples, especially eagles, just is, is very very high. Uh, personally, I'm not buying any coins uh, because of that reason. Um, if I were to buy, I would buy 1,000 ounce bars at this point. And we are selling these at 60 cents above spot for silver. Uh, gold, I mean, if you go with the one kilo bar since one, you can also get some other very low premium. So uh, in some ways, the way I like, like to look at it is buy bars when coin premiums are very high. Um, and then, you know, if you ever see a switch where coin premiums go back down to, say, $2.50 above spot for eagles, uh, then you can actually sell the bars and potentially go back into the coins themselves. Um, but, you know, when you see premiums of $10 or so, uh, I would stay away from it. Okay, another question coming in from uh, Peter Frowine. He's asking, where do you see the price of gold by the end of this year, 2023, and also the price of silver by the end of 2023? Kind of putting you on the spot there. I still think it's going to go up. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see gold back around 2000 and silver around 25 or so. Um, now, keep in mind, these are pretty much guesses. Um, but I, I, I do feel that we're going to, to find a rebound because we are entering in or we are in a stagflation. Um, and this is going to take a long time. Inflation going to stay high for a long time. And gold and silver traditionally have done extremely well. If you go back to the stagflation of the 1970s, we had a 26% increase per year for 11 years. And I think all the conditions are becoming such that, that we're going to have a repeat of that. So it's really a matter of market psychology and when people are going to, the mass people are going to rediscover these metals. Uh, but I, I see them doing extremely well uh, for the rest of the, of the decade. Now, uh, it might not happen that quickly. You might have to wait a little bit longer, but you know it, it is going going to go up. All right, I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, Derek Cho, he was saying he he got those numbers from Kitco and and Abnex. And you recently put out a short video explaining why gold doesn't need to pay interest. So I'm going to play this this short video. It's only about a minute or so for for the viewers, and then I'd like you to let us know why you did this video and the importance of understanding this. So here's here's the video. Igor Gregerson from Silver Bullion. Uh, sometimes customers ask us why should they buy gold and silver when it doesn't pay any interest. And to illustrate this point, uh, what we have here is a typical one kilo gold bar, and this kind of bar was worth about fifteen thousand dollars back in the year two thousand. Now, if you would have taken this money and you put it in your average uh, savings account in a bank, after 22 years, you would have had $600 worth of interest. On the other hand, if you would have bought and kept this bar after 22 years, you would have had $60,000 in return. So that's essentially why gold does not need to pay an interest and it tends to appreciate over time in a very reliable manner. All right, so if we can ask you why why doesn't gold need to pay an interest? And, and I think we also hear people telling us, you know, gold doesn't pay a yield. So that's why they don't see the value of gold. But if you can, go ahead and, and let us know your, your take on this. Yeah, so the video was in Singapore dollars. Um, and that interest rate from the banks, that's actually numbers coming from the Central Bank of Singapore, uh, MAS. And it basically showed that in Singapore, you were getting 0.2% you know, in interest per year since the year 2000. So uh, it's a sort of a way to, to get people to, to realize that gold is an appreciating asset over time, whereas currency is a depreciating asset. And so it depreciates by the amount of inflation you hear. And then, you know, we can go into whether that inflation is accurate or whether it's higher and so on and, and how it's being calculated. But assuming that that's the official inflation loss of value of your currency is, um, it's, that's how much you lose. But people don't realize that. People always use, you know, their local currency as a point of reference. And as long as inflation isn't too high, it's, they don't think about the fact that it falls by 2 or 3%. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, in that chart, if you would have kept it in a bank, <clears throat> getting almost no interest, uh, you would have lost 21% in that case uh, of your purchasing power. Uh, if you put it into gold, of course, you, you would have gotten 
in that case, I think it was uh, around four four times the Persian power because gold did very well since uh, the year 2000. So, uh, and this is true, you know, throughout most 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 of the time as you're going back. Um, I have another chart, which, you know, if you click on the link to that, I'm actually comparing the one year treasury bill of the United States uh, with performance of the gold in US dollars since 1970s. And uh, you would find that gold went up a factor of 50 and the US treasury went up a factor of 11. And once you inflation adjusted, you know, you're still doing up much, much, much better with gold. And the key thing to sort of uh, realize so with gold or long periods of time is that it appreciates the most during times of crisis. So between uh, 1970 to 1981 in the United States, gold appreciated about 26% per year. And then, you know, once Volkmar came and increased interest rates up to 20% and restored the trust in the United States dollar, um, gold didn't do very well. But for 25 years from 1981, all the way to say 2007 or so, uh, it, it wasn't very interesting. And that's why so much of the normal investing public sort of lost interest in gold. Um, and then it really started again in 2007, uh, 2008 with the financial crisis. And since then it's been going up 7.8% or so per year. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is long-term gold will, will go up uh, because it's measured in say US dollars and US dollars always go down based on inflation. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's not a, you know, it's a fact. The government tells you that. And uh, because of that, when people say, oh, I don't buy gold because it doesn't pay interest, it doesn't quite make sense because people don't, don't understand that part. And so this video, by showing the actual stacks of money, you know, was a way to make people aware uh, of, of this difference. Okay. Uh, got another question coming in from uh, Patrick Bateman. I know you're busy. I don't know if you had a chance to follow this too much, but what do you think about Moscow's gold exchange? What do you think about that? Um, I'll have to look more into it at this point. I, I don't have uh, I don't have a very clear answer. I, I, I do know that uh, Russian gold now uh, can only be exported. Right? There was an interesting story with Valkambi and the Swiss, uh, which claimed that they were still able to get it refined, and then the Swiss government said, "No, you can't." Um, but and I do know there's a lot of demand in Russia for gold by people, so. Uh, but I, I, I don't know enough about the details to really, you know, be able to have an opinion on that. But but I'll look into it because it sounds something interesting to look into. Okay. Another question from uh, Peter Frohwein. Uh When most monetary systems around the world crash and the U.S. dollar loses its reserve status, do you see all money going back to a gold standard or maybe a form of a gold standard? Um, I think what we've seen throughout history is that when you have a reserve currency and people stop trusting it, uh, then that country is going to have to create a new currency. I mean, that's what happened in Weimar Republic in Germany, for example. Uh, that's the rice marks, they had to go back to the gold mark. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily go in a smooth line. They didn't go to gold right away because they didn't have enough gold. Uh, they just took the assets you know, that Germany as a government had back then and kind of use that as a proxy and then end up getting more gold and then back to with gold again. Uh, what a government needs is to restore trust in a currency. And to do that, you need to back it with something people can trust. And gold always played a big role in it. So uh, the problems that a lot of people are going to face today, I guess, with gold, is they're going to say that it's deflationary, so on, so on, so on. But I mean, we did well as a deflationary currency in, say, 19th century. So uh, but what, what, what I can be pretty sure of is that gold is going to be part of that. Uh, whether it's going to be uh, an actual gold standard and so on, you know, we'll, we'll have to see uh, how that plays out. Um, my guess is that it's going to be part of that and it's, it has to be whatever basically people will accept as, as uh, something that they can put their faith in again. Okay, another, another question from uh, Paul D. Um, with a lot of talk about the, the financial collapse and things like that, do you see the collapse where the dollar actually goes to zero? Or or I've been thinking about this as well. 
Is it more where we just need a new type of uh, or something that can challenge the SWIFT system where transactions can be made outside of dollars that would cause less use of dollars, which would then bring the dollar, bring the dollar down in some ways? Yes, uh, this is a very big thematic because if you're living outside the United States, um, you sometimes get to see how powerful really the dominance of the United States is throughout the financial systems, uh, you know, worldwide, because uh, the United States can essentially tell a company specifically if needed, uh, you can do this, you can do that, otherwise you want to close your bank account, nobody's going to want to work with you, no bank is going to touch you, and, you know, you're going to go out of business, so you better do what I want. So that's essentially, you know, a situation where sometimes countries, sometimes companies find themselves. And I think in the past, the United States didn't use that power very much. And, you know, there was this policy of talk softly and carry a big stick. Um, the big stick might have been the military, but it was also uh, the bank swift system and so on. And so I think since the year 2000, you know, as AML and KYC has become bigger and bigger and it's getting much more harder to get a bank account and doing you're doing your trans is getting harder and so on. Uh, set power of the United States to um, put up sanctions or, you know, let's just look at tornado, for example, what happened in the crypto um, realm, where suddenly somebody is deemed as uh, uh, a sanctioned entity and suddenly anybody who had to deal with a sanctioned entity sort of has to wonder if some money is going to flow. So these things are creating a stress. And so there's an international sort of demand to have choices. And um, I think in practice nowadays, you know, the Chinese have been, I think, working for the last 10, 20 years on creating uh, systems that are getting large enough and scaled enough to sort of provide an alternative. And I just have to mention Union Pay. If you're not familiar with Union Pay, that's essentially the second most popular credit card out there. Uh, I forget number one is either MasterCard or Visa. Um, then comes Union Pay, then comes the other one. And uh, the, the Russians, which were vacationing in Turkey, for example, when, when the Ukraine conflict started, uh, they ended up having the Visa and MasterCards frozen. Suddenly they couldn't pay their hotel bill, you know, but if you had a union card pay, uh, it worked. So you can bet that all the Russians now are going to union pay. And of course, Russia cannot use the SWIFT system anymore. So they're looking to get away from the dollar. And, uh, you know, another consequence of the US dollar being the reserve currency is that with, say, oil being traded in US dollars, as the oil price goes up and US dollar terms, you know, it's always painful for everybody who, who has US dollars. Uh, but it's even more painful if you have euros, for example, because uh, the euro used to be, you know, one euro will buy you $1.20 or so US dollars. And the euro has fallen because interest rates are going up with the US dollar. And so now it's only 20%, I mean, one to one, which means that on top of the price increases of oil, uh, if you earn your money in euros, you have to put an additional you know, was it 15% plus or so on top of that that you're paying. So um, in essence, the fact that everything goes through the United States uh, dollar makes the world very, very dependent on it, gives the United States a huge amount of power. And there is this tendency to want to be able to have an alternative and then sort of switch to whichever is, is easier. And um, I think we are definitely seeing that developing more and more. So I believe the United States rests on a number of pillars which made it the reserve currency and which made it, you know, so strong and, and set currency everybody frees to whenever there's an issue. Even so, the United States, so much money is being printed, people still flee to the very currency, you know, which has been uh, depreciating in some ways in, in such big terms. But um, so, and I think these pillars are sort of eroding. Uh, it will take time, um, but, you know, there's definitely a tendency uh, towards a new reserve currency, but there isn't a clear contender right now. I mean, the euro has so many problems. The Japanese yen, I mean, the debt levels are atrocious, and they really are under development uh, anymore as they used to be. Uh, the Chinese yuan is is not, you, you really have two yuans. You have the yuans inside China. You have a yuan, international yuan. Uh, 
But until China opens up, it's not really that much of an option either. And so you're sort of in this limbo state. And uh, I think gold and silver is also obvious choice. It's just that there's uh, just a lot of uh, this momentum that has to be built. And that momentum takes time. And, uh, you know, once the question came, where do I see gold and silver going? Well, I, I see more and more of that momentum coming because remember, when we are looking at the gold price and, you know, people are feeling, well, if the gold price is down, inflation is going up, gold should be a lot higher. And, and I agree with the sentiment. But if you're looking at it from in comparison to stocks, for example, gold did very well. In US dollar terms, gold is down maybe 5 6% since the beginning of the year. Stocks are down 20 25%. Um, and if you are in euros, gold is actually up, up 6 7% because the US dollar has become stronger. So uh, based on all these factors, you know, that momentum is building. Uh, I think more and more people will be gravitating towards gold. Uh, as being that reserve store of value, we might as well call it currency because it does have currency value uh, symbol which doesn't have jurisdictional and counterparty risk. Uh, and it's something that has been working for 5,000 years for us whenever we end up in periods where we are shifting, where the trust in one reserve currency is sort of falling. So um, I think the direction is very clear. Um, it's just a matter of timing. And you know, along the way, you're also going to have some bumps up and down, which is why I always recommend to people not to leverage themselves um, much, at least in these things. Uh, and why physical gold is so good because you don't have that counterparty risk that you have otherwise in being direct in the financial system. And um, I like to kind of, you know, put it under my bed in some ways, uh, figuratively speaking, and just sleep well at night and kind of see how things play out and not over leverage either way. Um, but I bought silver last Friday. Uh, I think, you know, it's just, when interest rates go up, Silver and gold typically falls because the US dollar will get stronger and you're measuring it in US dollars. Uh, but they haven't been falling much anymore. When they fall a little bit, then they kind of go up. So I, I, I kind of see some strengths. We're probably going to see interest rates going up more, but it kind of feels like the market is not going to push it down much more than that. And um, once those messages from the Fed are going to become uh, less uh, tending towards higher rates fast, um, then, you know, probably see gold and silver start going up quite a bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you brought up a, a number of interesting points there. Um, one thing that I, that I do recall was when we had that, um, the truckers, the trucker event in, in Canada, we saw a bunch of Canadian new customers come in and start purchasing gold. Do you, you recall that? Yes, yes. It, 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 yeah, it had to do with, you know, sort of that watershed event where the Canadian government decided that if you're protesting um, against COVID regulations, then they're entitled to freeze your bank account, which is highly questionable and, you know, sets a precedent of something which you're not supposed to have in a democracy, in a free democracy, I would say. So it makes sense for people to sort of go back into gold uh, and, and silver as a way of opting out of that system. Hmm. Okay, another question from uh, Derek Cho here. He's asking if you see deflation in the future. If yes, won't precious metals deflate as well? Uh, this is according to thinkers out there, such as Harry Dent, who think gold is going down to $800 or so. The thing is, nobody has a, um, a crystal ball. So is there going to be some deflation? Well, uh, there surely will be some. But how long it is and where gold will go, that's kind of opens the question. I, I don't think gold will go down to 800 at all. Um, what's happening right now, which we have to be aware of, that is when, when the United States raises interest rates and raises it relatively fast the way they're doing right now. And, you know, if I were the Fed, I would be doing the same thing because you you need, when you have inflation at 9%, uh, you need to convince the markets that will do whatever it is you need to do to bring inflation down. In reality, that's probably not the case uh, because the pain will get too long. But if they can convince the market about that, then it might might help with this. But the point I'm trying to make now is 
as the United States dollar becomes more expensive, there are a lot of countries out there throughout the world which they bought oil, bought other things, and those things are denominating your United States dollars. And they are now owing US dollars. So as they have to pay that back, uh, their currency or, or their earnings, which else they're going to pay it with, is going to probably be in the local currency, which probably has fallen value versus United States dollars, which means that debts are now becoming higher, which means it becomes harder to service that debt. And uh, that's where, you know, economies can get into trouble. And when that happens, that can sort of be a push towards a deflationary sort of uh, period and in, in recessions. And that's basically what, uh, you know, one of the main arguments are against raising interest rate. Um, now, the Fed will say, well, we only care about the United States. We don't care about the rest of the world. Um, but, you know, there can be a scenario for a while where the United States dollar indeed is going to be uh, in high demand in order to pay these debts. But what might also happen is that these countries say, you know what, I don't care. I'm just going to refute these debts. I'm not going to pay. Uh, so uh, do we have a crystal ball? Do we know what's going to happen? We don't. Um, I think that we, no matter what happens, uh, the amount of geopolitical tension we are witnessing now, uh, it's the amount of money printing that we have now. And keep in mind, it's it's not so much how much are we spending this year. It's more a structural systemic kind of problem. Uh, the United States has, you know, huge amounts of unfunded liabilities. And they have to pay for Social Security now, for Medicare, for Medicaid. These things used to, you know, have uh, budget surpluses, which were just being spent back then. Now you actually have to supplement that. And so the debts are just going to go worse and worse and worse uh, long term. The tendency is there. And they have to be paid for somewhere. And, you know, do countries really want to, uh, you know, make that T-shirt for $1.50 or something like that? Um, for a dollar, which costs get printed or something. Degree? And, you know, that brings us back to, to this balance, where these different forces, uh, on the one hand, deflationary, on the other hand, the trust that might not be so for the United States dollars in the future, and how is it going to balance out, and how it's all going to fit together when we put geopolitics into it. So it becomes a situation which is so complex uh, that I think nobody can say exactly where it's going to go uh, in the short or even the medium term, but, you know, long term, uh, I think it's very clear that, that you, you would want to go into something like gold and silver. And so if you were to, let's say, sell your gold now, your silver now, waiting for $800 gold, well, it, it might go up to 3000 And then what you do? You, you, you buy the gold at 3000 right? So everybody has their own answer for these things. But um, uh, I will be careful to think, be too convinced about either direction. Um, other than long term is going to go up. Okay, great point there. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, Peter Frowine, he has another question for you here. He's asking um, if you see this worldwide economic event being worse than the 1929 depression, what are your, your thoughts on this? Uh, so, I, I like to follow Ray Dalio, right? Ray Dalio says that we are probably in the early 1930s or, or so, um, as far as similarities to, to, to history. And um, yeah, it, it, is, it is a bit a worrisome sort of period where we are coming. Now, a few differences, I guess, with the 1930s in, in what happened in that period is the countries became more and more isolationist, which, which is sort of the tendency we have right now. And when you become more isolationist, you know, trade efficiency will go down. Um, China has produced, over the last 20, 25 years, right, has, has been a huge deflationary force in the world. I mean, uh, I think one reason why we've all been living prettily and doing well was because the Chinese will produce a shirt at say one dollar instead of ten dollars, right? And so Walmart ended up spreading all that efficiency around. 
Uh, and now the Chinese themselves, they can only produce at one dollar. I mean, the cost in China way up. It was uh, two or three times uh, before COVID. And, you know, a coffee is almost as expensive as, uh, as it is in the United States. Um, so uh, that efficiency is partly gone. But then you add, you know, say trade issues and so on, where as the United States doesn't allow chip manufacturing equipment to be sent to China. And yet almost all apples, for example, are built in China. So how is that going to work out long term? Right. I mean, it probably means that Apple phones are going to have to go up somehow uh, in price because they either build factories somewhere else or it's going to get more expensive to build or who knows how it's going to flow out. So geopolitical trends are highly inflationary, I would say. And, and we had the prime minister of Singapore actually give a speech recently about addressing the nation. And one of his points is this inflation that is coming now. Uh, it's not going to go away. It's not something, you know, which people might have this impression, oh, it's a post-COVID one-year thing and everything going to turn to normal. No, no, because geopolitics are changing all of that. And those easy efficiencies that we got through the last 25 years are now being reversed. So uh, we might have energy prices going down with Ukraine and so on being solved at some point, uh, but we are going to have inflation stay, you know, high, um, for, for a long period. Um, and like the 1920s or uh, 1930s, countries will become more and more isolationist. They're going to pay more for the goods because they want to build it inside the country or only buy from certain other countries and so on. And uh, then there might also be a run on certain resources because maybe you need a certain type of rare metal or something like this. And suddenly you feel very strongly that you ought to have access to it. And if the other country sort of cuts you off from it, right, then uh, what are you going to do about it? And that's how World War II started. I mean, not, not, but yeah, to some degree, World War II started that way. And that's how Pearl Harbor basically ended up, you know, happening because the United States cut off the Japanese from oil and the Japanese basically were very dependent on it. And they felt that, you know, that ended up warranting uh, war with the United States, which then ended up, you know, <laughs> the way it ended. <laughs> but yeah. it, 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 those are some of the factors, those, those are some of the things, right, that are worrisome about the period of time that we are in. Uh, but at the same time, what we all have to remember is we did not have nuclear weapons back in 1929 or 1930s. So the idea of a world war, I think, is very unlikely because I think none of the big powers and so on uh, want to have uh, a nuclear war and you know we went through the cold war with russia and, and i think it's very well understood said you don't do certain things uh, you don't start throwing bombs around um, and the way i feel about it i also think it's rather unlikely that we're going to have armed conflicts uh, in these things um, but we're going to have co uh, more of an economic conflict and so it's that economic conflict, you know, if you haven't read it, I would really recommend you read Currency Wars from Jim Richards. I mean, I really love this book. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, I ended up meeting one of the ministers in Singapore, uh, who was Minister of Industry and Trade. And, you know, I gave him that book and he said, oh, I already read it. That's what he said. So um, uh, I'm sure Singaporean politicians sort of are aware of some of the concepts in this book. And in this book, they basically say that when you have a financial war, you end up, uh, different countries will try to destroy each other's countries or the credibility in it. For example, if the, China would say, I no longer take the US dollar for payment, right? And everybody wants to have a Chinese product and the world is dependent on Chinese products. Uh, you're going to have to use the yuan or you're going to have to use something else. And say the United States says, well, I don't accept the yuan and I'm not going to let it be going through the financial system, right? And so essentially countries nowadays can create so much economic harm to each other uh, that this can end up becoming a stalemate. And how do you get out of that stalemate? Well, Jim Richards, he was playing war games for the Pentagon. Um, and in his book, he describes how he ended up winning and he was playing China in these war games. And he ended up putting uh, Chinese gold in Switzerland 
and then forcing everybody or saying we only sell goods and buy goods using uh, the gold held in Switzerland being a neutral party uh, in some way of secure accounting system. And uh, that would cause everybody to sort of say, okay, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not trusting the one, but I'm trusting gold stored in a Swiss world. And I would say in reality, you know, China probably wouldn't choose Switzerland, will probably choose uh, Singapore uh, for many reasons for something like this. But, you know, I could see a scenario like this play out. And again, we're going back to physical gold and silver. So the more trust is lost uh, throughout the world in, in currencies and systems like that, uh, some more gold and silver is going to come back and play a role. And so coming back to the question about the 1930s, uh, so there are all these similarities, but, you know, because the reason mentioned uh, above, I think I think we won't see a hot world war, uh, you know, anytime soon. But I think all the contenders are going to put a lot of money in armaments because they are going to measure themselves and they want to create a situation where... Uh, you know, neither party, or both parties feel strong enough uh, to be able to contend with the other one. And I think that's what we're seeing. Okay, okay. A well, lot to chew on there. Thanks again, Gregor. Appreciate it. A uh, question from, from Mr. Nguyen. He says, uh, thank you, Gregor. And how readily, how readily accessible is our holdings for non-citizens in Singapore? It, it doesn't make a difference uh, whether you are a Singapore citizen, U.S. citizen or so. We are not a financial institution. We are not regulators, one. We are not subject under FATCA or OECD. Um, so um, there's, there's no difference. Uh, you can, if you are in Singapore, you can you can go and audit your, your bullion. You have somebody remotely audit for you. Uh, if you need to have it at home, you can we can ship it. Uh, we're gonna be announcing some interesting ways that you can swap gold um, uh, with with a gold savings account, which is something we'll be bringing out pretty soon. So, um, yeah, it's there's really no limits um, as far as I can see. Okay, let me move on here. I think we got about maybe five more minutes or so with Gregor. So, so absolutely, feel free to to get those questions in there pretty quick but so through all this we are saying that silver and gold is actually still a very very good and press investment despite these these lower prices that we see from time to time uh, yeah yeah i mean i think i went into some of the, the reasons before but um uh, especially silver you know if you look at silver right now i mean i mean the ratio is over 90 um, so what I tend to people tend to tell people is, look, if you want to buy gold, just buy silver first. Uh, don't, maybe don't buy the ten dollar maple uh, American Eagle premium. Uh, you can always buy a hundred ounce bar or one thousand ounce bar, and you get a much lower premium. But buy silver now because that ratio is going to come back down. Uh, let's say it's coming back down to fifty. And if it comes back down to 50, you switch back from silver into gold. And instead of having one ounce of gold for that same amount of money, you would have had 1.8 ounces of gold. So um, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to buy whichever metal is cheaper compared to the other one on a historical basis. And, you know, silver is extremely cheap. I think gold is also a good buy right now. But, you know, uh, going to silver first, essentially. Okay, another question coming out here from uh, VK Travelog. He says, would it be cool if we can spend our precious metals holdings using something like an ATM card or a credit card? And and I think we kind of had something along those lines with, with cash. Yeah, so uh, there's something to... Our first focus at Silver Bullion has always been to provide what we call systemic wealth protection, meaning that we make your holdings of gold and silver as safe as we possibly can. And one way we do that is to sell you a specific gold bar or silver bar by serial number to you on your name um, as private property. Now, the good thing about that, it's your private property and there are a lot of benefits coming from that security-wise. Uh, the problem is I, I, I cannot cut little pieces off of it <laughs> or you know spend a portion of that. And so in order to have an ATM or a bank account, we essentially would have to have 
something like a gold savings account. And that's what we've been working on for the last two or three years um, with a few special sort of features uh, thrown in. And in Silver in website, we really haven't been promoting it much uh, because we are finishing some integration work and so on. Uh, but once that is ready, uh, there will be a lot more options coming. Uh, whether we can hook up a credit card to it, uh, we are sort of looking into it. We've been in talks with a number of companies and uh, there are some back and forth about backing and so on because uh, the way we would like it to be done is that there's essentially a central... Uh, there's essentially you need some buffer funds in there and, and whether these buffer funds need to be per individual or like a complete one and so on and and we're working on that uh can't promise that it's happening yet but you know it, it seems like something uh worthwhile to have not for your star storage holdings uh because those are meant to be completely separated and off you know cut off from the financial system um but for the gold savings account uh, which is also fully backed by gold, by the way, and, and we'll present how we do that uh, with a lot of transparency. Um, but it's going to be fungible, meaning that you can buy, say, $52 of it, or you can deduct you know, $5.12 to buy a coffee. Um, so we're creating the basis for that, and we'll see if we can, we can hook it up to something like uh, a credit card. Um, but you would also be able to convert it into a token, you know, a gold token, for example. So we're looking at liquidity options, you, you know, wherever possible on that, that product. Yeah. Okay, last question. I know we got to get you out of here. Peter Frowine, he's asking, what kind of silver did you recently buy? I, I, I bought the 1,000 ounce bar. So <laughs> 1,000 ounce bars have the, the lowest premiums. Uh, and, you know, with silver being so cheap right now, you're looking around 19,000. Uh, dollars. If you go to our website right now, I, I just looked at it. It was uh, nineteen thousand six hundred or so uh, US dollars. So you're looking at a sixty sixty five cent premium per ounce, and that's what I buy. And you know, maybe I might add to it. I was I was sitting next to um, one of the major major refineries out there. You know, at a conference uh, in Singapore, the Asia Pacific First, First Metal Conference, and we we're talking. Uh, with the head of the refinery about, you know, the mid-production of, of the coins. And I was saying, well, why can't you guys produce more coins? Um, and, you know, the answer was essentially that it's a boom and bust sort of issue with demand, where sometimes people are really in demand for these coins, and other times uh, they have some machines and they just can't run full production because there's not enough demand. And so if they're putting a lot of money now to increase that demand, that, that production capacity and so on, um, by next year, there might not be enough demand anymore. So that's what they told me. And that's kind of why I said, hey, look, uh, how about we come with some sort of agreement? You, you, you build more supply, minting supply, and when demand is short uh, on these coins, we make some sort of deal, so you give it to us at a slight discount. I go to my customers and I ask them, hey, do you want to convert that 1,000 ounce bar back into... 1,000, say, uh, silver coins, whether it's Purse Mint or, or Maple Leafs or Britannia coins or whatever that is. Um, because in that way, we can use our 1,000 ounce um, bar as a kind of buffer to help the mint, you know, keep keep those mints running in times of low, low demand. And so I've been trying to kind of put that as a, uh, as a thought and, and see if we can do anything like that. But, you know, in such, in such sense, I would look at, you know, just like you have a gold and silver ratio and you want to buy whichever metal is cheaper, it kind of makes sense to look at the, the coin and bar sort of relative premiums and sort of buy whichever uh, seems to be relatively cheap compared to each other, um, you know, based on what the normal ratio is. And, you know, if you can provide a cheap way for a customer in the future to convert into coins, then that would be great. Uh, so, again, can't promise anything, but, you know, it, it's kind of the kind of things which I'm trying to sort of look into um, in whether that's, that's optional. But based on current price, especially in the United States, you know, on Eagles, uh, I would rather go into bars. And so I bought the 1,000 ounce bars because those are say, the lowest premium right now. And um, uh, while it's a bit quite a chunk of money, you know, 19,000, I think it's relatively cheap for a bar like that right now. 
All right, Gregor Gregerson, I, I know we got to get you out of here. We appreciate the time you've given. I, I hope we can do this again soon. Maybe once every month, month and a half or so. Would that be okay? I would love to, sure. Okay. All right, Gregor, we know we got to get you out of here, so we'll, we'll let you go. And um, take care, and uh, thanks for your time again. Take care. All Have right, a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gregor. Okay, so Gregor Gregerson, uh, thanks. I, I guess you can – yeah, that – we thank you for his time again. Uh, Vincent and I will be here for, for a bit longer. If you folks want to ask us some, some questions, go ahead and shoot us some questions. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Nguyen, there, there was a question there. Let me see if I can uh, find that again. Uh, Mr. Nguyen is asking how he can, uh, how he can start. How he can start. Um, his aim is to, to have some holdings with us here in Singapore. Uh, that one... But as we, we pretty much show like every week, um, you can just go on to our website, silverbullion.com.sg. In fact, I'll, I'll try and pull that up. And then you can just go ahead and decide which type of an account you would like. Is it a personal account where it's just you? Uh, is it a joint account where it may be you and, and, and a spouse or, or someone? Uh, Precious Metals IRA type of an account. Those are, are getting more and more popular as people understand what, what's really happening. So that would be the first step. Uh, or just shoot us an email, sales at silverbullion.com.sg. And uh, that, that's one way to get the account going. Let me see if I can um, if I can uh, get, get to that for you. Um, hang on there. Um, let me see if I can get it. Uh, yeah, so, so in this case, um, again, sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Nguyen, you, you would just go down. Um, basically, your 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 you would come here to sign up. That's what you would want to do is, is sign up for, for the account. And then uh, you would go ahead and choose between one of these, these six accounts, personal, joint, a trust, the retirement account, which would be the Precious Metals IRA account. And of course, the business account, maybe if you want to use that for your business and join account uh, with, with a minor. So you can go ahead and, and choose uh, any one of any one of those. So let me see what else is, is out there. Uh, hang on. Let me just switch. Um, I just need to switch a, a scene here. Hang on. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll find that later. Uh, what else is out there? Um, yeah, it is pretty simple to, to open an, an account. Uh, Peter Frowine, do you own both gold and silver? What silver do you buy? Me, personally, I, I do. Um, I think my ratio is about uh, 100 to 1, meaning uh, for every 100 ounces of silver that, that I'm fortunate to pick up, I will try and, and have an ounce of gold. Uh, that's just a personal ratio for, for myself. So 100 to 1. For every 100 ounces of silver, I, I try to get uh, one, ounce, one ounce of gold. Um, hang on. Let me... I'm, I'm trying to uh, switch to, to something here. Maybe, maybe this is it. Uh, okay. Yeah, so Vincent, he says that uh, for international customers preferring convenience, check out the Gold Savings Account, or GSA, we call it for short, Gold Savings Account. Uh, there's a link there. And, and all this, it, it's, it is there. The gold is, is there. It's verifiable. You can see that it's actually there. And again, the, the percentages over spot are extremely low to go ahead and, and buy the, the, the gold through the Gold Savings um, app. So GSA, Gold Savings Account. So those uh, that's something that... We've been working on for a while, as Gregor mentioned, and uh, it's been doing pretty good. It's uh, slowly moving up as more and more people find out about it. Uh, so, you know, again, appreciate you you all being here. Let me look through through other questions if if you if you have uh, any uh, VK travel out. Yes, absolutely. We're we're going to try and make this uh, a monthly or at least a you know month and a half or so uh, a series where we bring Gregor on and and you know just to get updates on on the reserve, see how things are going for people who do store with us, and you know maybe every now and then the new products like the gold savings account, you know how these are progressing, and of course current events. And, and part of the the point of this is we really want you guys to get to know Gregor. And and to my fault, you know when I bring Gregor on, I'm always you know talking about products and services. Which there are many, and, and which I, I do hope you know people get familiar with. Uh, but to my fault, I, I tend to do that too much, and, and I neglect letting all of you have a chance to know Gregor on the personal side. So, so I really want to to try and 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 do this for for all of us, where we get to know Gregor better. 
uh, I tell you, he's he's a pretty incredible guy when when you you get to know him. So I I, I hope that you get to know him. <laughs> so we'll we'll bring him on more. So that that that's uh that's a great great point there. Let me see what else is out there. Um, Harold B, is GSA available in silver? I believe it's just gold right now. Uh, for starters, we we started with gold, uh, GSA gold savings account. I I always hear whispers about silver, so I'm I'm maybe you know maybe it could happen. Maybe it's in the works. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, great point. I will definitely uh you know kind of uh see what's what's going on there. If if uh, they're if we're headed that way, I I I do think we we would be, but naturally we we should be. So great great point there. Great. Great question. Um, yeah, again, VK Travelogue. I tell you what, Singapore has opened up. Uh, if you come by Singapore, you know, we will absolutely meet with you. Just stop by uh, the office. Um, you know, maybe if it's uh, if construction is okay, maybe we can take a walk down to, to the vault, see how it's doing there. But um, yeah, a lot of construction going on, so not sure about, about that part. But and the point being, come down and meet us. Uh, we we're very accessible. I mean, you can see Gregor; he will make time. Um, you know, and and it's it's really all about trust, and and that's something that we we want each of you to know. Um, and it's something that each of us here do know, and we try to you know build uh, a lot of the business around trust. Uh, extremely important, not just yesterday, but today, and and for sure tomorrow as we move on down the road. Uh, that, that's something critically important there. Uh, Harold B. Vincent chiming in here. Silver not available yet. It's challenging rolling out to partners or partner vaults globally. We require vault operators to scan gold bars for inventory tracking, and silver will be an even bigger task. And, and again, this is part of the whole transparency. Um, transparency, I'll, I'll just call it a program. Uh, you know, it, it's it's at the core. It's pretty much at the core of what Silver Bullion does in anything we do. It, it's transparency. Uh, we we understand. You know, a lot of times a vault is a is is a big secret. You know, a, a big you know secret. You know, the you don't know what happens in a vault, and and you know our vault is well lit. It's well lit. Uh, we want it to be transparent to each of you. We want you to know what's going on there. We we want to invite you. I mean. We've had a number of people actually come in the vault and visit. You know, they've come in, they they've seen their gold, seen their silver. Other vaults, they may tell you, "Hey, no, no, you you can't come, you can't come in." You know, there's some type of maybe an insurance deal or whatever it is. Uh, but because we own our own vault, um, and I think we have probably the best insurance out there. The insurance companies know how we run things. They they are absolutely happy with things. They give us insurance coverages like mysterious disappearance. Something should disappear and, and we don't know what happened, you're covered. You're going to be covered. And so, you know, we, we do invite you, you know, if, if ever you're here and uh, if construction is tamed down a bit or toned down a bit. Um, absolutely. We've, as I've said, we've had people in the past come through the vault. Uh, they've seen how we work, they've seen how we test things, they've seen how their items are stored. And, and I tell you what, I, I think. I'm just going to say 10 out of 10, walk away pretty happy about it. So uh, that's a great question there. Uh, let me see what else is out there. Um, let's see. Uh, Patrick Starr asking, is it true? Is it true? Banks in the USA are charging, charging to deposit cash. And Vincent chimed in. When your bank charges negative interest rates, it's doing exactly what You've said they are charging you to to deposit cash. Um, so again, it's another another thing with with banks. Uh, it's another reason to have one foot, you know. Of course, in the current financial system, uh, it's how we operate, and it's good to start understanding how to get one foot out of the current system in preparation for for what may be coming. Uh, perhaps to set your family up for. Uh, generational wealth as this as this transition comes through. So it's another uh, another great question there, and we're heading up close to the top of the hour. So we'll be we'll be wrapping up soon. I mean, I, I think it was. I appreciate each of you being here. I appreciate the questions uh, that you had for Gregor and and that you have for Vincent and I. Uh, we're always more than happy to to answer your questions, and um, you know the support that you give us is is phenomenal and likewise we want to support support each of you in in what your questions may be or what your thoughts or your 
concerns may be and trying to get those answered for you. Uh, so let me just take a quick peek out here. Last few questions here. Um, let's see, John Bethea, uh, Patrick Guest, going back to Patrick Guest, they charge for my deposits, but they used to charge and they used to charge for rolled coins. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, we, everybody ends up, you know, going home at the end of the day with loose change in their pockets, right? You put the coins down. Next thing you know, you have a big pile of coins. Even us here in, in, in Singapore, uh, we have a, you know, just a bunch of loose change laying around. And, and if you take it to the bank, um, I think there, there's a charge, a, a few dollars for every X amount of, of coins that you that you you give back to them or, or try to get dollar bills for or bills for. So even here, you know, you if you give them your coins to get back bills, you're going to lose a little bit that that bank is it's going to take something from you. So it's not just in the U.S. I, it happens here happens here as well uh let's see what what else is out there um okay so i i guess um you know that that's it i uh, it was fun doing a little bit of ama with you guys uh so i I'm, I'm sure gregor enjoyed it uh he's um he always has an opinion on things and a, a well thought opinion uh which is why we hope to bring him on more for you you to have a chance to to get to know him uh so with that uh Vincent and I, we, we appreciate you you being here. Um, look forward to doing it again next week. Um, as always, let us know in your comments what's on your mind, your thoughts, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Upcoming guest is going to be Nick Barashev. Uh, Nick Barashev will be coming up this week. Uh, so go ahead, please do uh, subscribe, hit that bell so you can be notified when that interview comes out. So having said that, we, will, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Um, Take care of each other. Be a blessing, not a burden. And as always, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up as well. And I'll see you guys next week. Vincent and I will see you guys next week. Appreciate it all. Take care.